What up, gang? This is Ken Zark, Ken Zilligan, Zika Milligan, the villain, Philip Trilligan. We are back on Umi Naku no Naku Koroni, or When the Seagulls Cry. My literacy rate is about to drop to the one per hundredth percentile. I think hundred, like hundred percentile means it's bad. Today we're joined by two guests, actually. I'm um, going to say what's up. Rena, we got my Rena figure. I just felt like having it um, nearby while I record today. And because I don't have my Higurashi shirt right now, I have to wash it. And it was like, oh, I want to have something of Higurashi, right? So I just grabbed my Rena figure and was like, hey, she's here. And I was like, I, I feel bad if I brought my Rena figure and not Nobara eating a watermelon. So she's here too. Like, eat the watermelon. Num, num, num. All right. And now she's bald. Okay, I think last episode, they was chatting it up inside the dorm. And it turns out that, I forget his name, but the tall dude with the black hair has a crush on one of the maids. And they're not really nice to her. They're not really nice to her at all. They're not nice to her at all. Um, the, um, all the, the parents, they're not really nice to her at all. And what it is, the, that boy, that like that little femme boy kid, he is actually her little brother. And he's really, he really, he really hates everybody because they're mean to her. And that other butler, like that butler, the one that I said looked like a creep. Yeah, he, he is a creep. He's actually a horrible person as I expected. Well, let's get back into it. I think, I think we left off in a tickle match. We were tickling each other. The four of us cousins were enjoying our stories, just shooting the breeze. Anyway, there were both guy, girls and guys here. Plus, we had people over a wide spread of ages, adult, high school, and elementary school. Even if we just talked about our own lives, the other three kept listening attentively. I think I'm finally getting used to all this. Jessica and Maria have grown more than I could have imagined in the past six years. To be honest, I was feeling a little uncomfortable, but talking like this... I guess that on the inside, nothing's really changed since back then. Is this the same voice I used before? I agree. You haven't changed a bit, even after six years. Even though your body's gotten gigantic, you're still just a little fucking kid inside. Wow, she's so precious. I'm a kid too! Yes, you are. You are indeed a kid. You didn't have to say it twice. Dumb fuck. Well, even you aren't gonna be a kid forever, are you, Maria? Maria? I mean, you're gonna transform from a kid to a cute young lady, aren't you? And then that happens, that flatters the bar chest will reach Jessica's level. Battler. I don't know. Hey, yo. Maybe, maybe, nay, come on, like, maybe let's not say that to elementary school or battler, like, what you, you want, you want some strange behavior? Do I gotta call Kendrick to wop, wop, wop your ass? <laughs> when that happens, you gotta let me get, B battler! Battler! Do I gotta call Kendrick to wop, wop, wop your ass? You can't say that, bro. You cannot say that. You can't say that. No. No. Nigga. My fucking P Drizzy looking ass. Don't agree. No. 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 no! No, Maria. You you can't make that kind of promise. That's bad, bad, bad. I promise I'll let him tell. No! Maria, don't keep that promise. Battler, battler, battler. You bet. You you better call the promise up. Do something, bro. Come on. Maria, you are you're a, you're an Arnis good. No! The guy you marry is gonna be really lucky. Hey, stop trying to change the subject by making it sound pretty. Maria, that promise never happened. Never. Promise is canceled? Yes. Yes, it's canceled. 
Hold on, I'm, I'm speaking as Battler. Yes, Mario, the promise is canceled. It was just a joke. Don't take it seriously. I would never do that, right, Battler? That's, that's what you're, that's what, that's what you're getting ready to say, right? As I thought, without battle, without battler and that little quartet, this group of cousins just didn't feel complete. <laughs> battler got a weird case. Why is he around? Hold on. <laughs> These six years have been kind of lonely. That's true. We didn't really goof off like this. Still, we did have some pretty constructive conversations, right? Stuff about preparing for our future, exam taking, finding jobs. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. Now that I'm here, we'll just talk all about stupid stuff and mess around. But I'm having more fun this year. Oh, oh hold on. Hold on, can I hit that? Oh, oh hold on. That's true. I agree. This year is the most fun yet. Goodness, my throat has already gone to callous. Ripping microphones from here to Dallas. Don't ask Alice if you don't believe me. I get in the visions like Stevie. Stevie, I said, from the child like Luigi. Oh, then that make this word. You can't get with this. Sweet like licorice, dangerous like syphilis. Lauren Hill is the goat. I keep letting you back in. Mario's sincere words probably spoke for everyone present. George stroke Monik Monokuma? Really? That's what I was about to say? Monokuma? George stroked off Monokuma? Okay. George stroked Ma Ma George stroked Mario's head and she giggled like a happy kitten. Oh, that's cute. Hold on, who fucking? That's the girl he liked. Shanan, Shanan, I ain't talking about Kanan. Hey, that was my favorite white hair character before Gojo popped through. I think I might like her more than Gojo actually. That's my favorite white hair character. Pardon me. Your meal is ready. Master George, come eat this pussy. A timid knocking sound and an equally timid voice of a young woman came through the door. Jessica answered brightly. Shanon, come in! You remember Battler, right? Jessica stood up from the bed and opened the door. Goodness! Jessica stood up from the bed and opened the door. I, I fucking read that already. There stood a servant girl who must have been about our age. It's been quite some time since we last met, Battler. It's nice to see you after six years. It's me, Shana. Trembling a little as she noticed me, she bowed deeply. All the bitches tremble when they see a nigga like me. Why you do- why you make that noise, bruh? Why you make that noise? I know what you finna think, nigga. <sighs> <sighs> Yo, you can't be talking like that, bro. That's sexual harassment. That's sexual harassment. What does Reese say? You freaky frog. He a little freaky frog. <laughs> I fucking love that nigga. <laughs> Jess got me surprised, but look at you, Shannon. You turn into a total beauty too. You've got fat ass titties. You're too kind, bro. Don't be, don't be chatting her up like that in front of, in front of the, in front of, in front of, in front of, in front of the dude that likes her, bro. Still, the food on this island must be really nutritional, huh? What are you eating and how you training to get boobs that big, battler? No, Battler! Guess I'll have to feel him a bit and see whether you or the Jessica are bigger, okay? Battler, no! Kill him! Kill him! With both hands poised and saliva dribbling from my mouth, I closed in. For the sake of justice and my personal honor, I'd like to point out that I don't suffer from some strange disease that makes my lymph nodes itch until I scratch my neck open in which they can only be prevented by fondling breasts. Higurashi reference? 
This is just a battleist style method of communication. No, nigga, you're a pervert. If I slowly close in on her like this, odds are eight, eight or nine out of ten, I get slapped or clobbered, right? So I can use this battleist style, my original technique to spark a gag like that and break the ice. Well, it also means I really do get to touch them in that one in ten chance, though, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. like that or never happen. At that point, my hands were less than a centimeter away from Shauna's boobs, but the counter strike had yet to come. She blessed and yo lowered her head in embarrassment when she realized what was going on. Battler, back off! You're taking advantage of her timid personality! That's not okay! I can't call you the goat if you do this! But she just stood there with both hands politely joined in front of her, not even trying to resist or cover her breasts. Hey, I wasn't planning on this. Please hit me right now or else I'm seriously gonna Which is why I was glad that Jessica chose that time to drive her elbow into the back of my head Jessica with the save Oh, thank you, Jessica Ooh, Why the hell are you thanking me? Seriously, my bad, Shana. I almost got overwhelmed by your hypnotic chest. More importantly, anyone who gets that close has got to be a molester. You've got to fight back when people do that. But you are an important guest, Battler. Now, look here. A, a, a pervert's a pervert whether he's a guest or not. All right, a girl's chest has got a got an air defense identification range of about 10 centimeters or so. Once someone trespasses within two centimeters, that's already an invasion of airspace. So you better scramble the jets immediately and give him an instant slap. I couldn't do such a thing because we are um furniture. Who the fuck told you that? Of course, she didn't want her breast touch, but if a guest so desired, she was prepared to sacrifice herself to suit their wants. A girl like this needs some urgent protection. To think such devoted girls still existed in this era. It's enough to make a man dizzy. But no! No! I'm coming at you with a perverted face again! Knock me down! Look out, perfect on her loose! This gag can't end until you deliver the punchline, so slap me! Please! Hit me! I... I cannot fulfill your request because I'm furniture. But... If it were in an order, I'd obey you because that is my duty. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll make it in order. The next time Battler tries to touch your breast, slap the fucking taste out of his mouth. I'm trying to touch my bitch. Fuck you think this shit is? I'm fucking that nigga up. Got it? Yes. As you wish, that I mean, um, George Sama. From now on, that's what I'll do. Please understand, Battler. Shannon announced this while bowing elegantly at me. Her expression was radiant. Aw, oh, that's so cute. Look at that. This, this sprite is so cute. I gave her a thumbs up to show I was fine with that. Six years ago, you might have been mistaken for a servant's daughter who lent a hand at your parents' work. But now you're a full-fledged adult servant. How long have you been working here? Well... I've had the pleasure of serving this household for about 10 years. Whatever the fuck that means. The kanji for her name is read as Shannon. Now here's another name that's far from typical for a Japanese person. Back in the day, as a, I was a kid myself, so I accepted her name without paying you much attention. Thinking about it now, her name is pretty unusual, even though she's not a member of the Ushiromiya family. Maybe it's like a servant's professional name or something. If so, that might explain why her name is so similar to Kanon, the kid I met in the Rose Garden. She's a long-term servant who served here since he was six years old. 
Her appearance had changed so much that I couldn't match her to the person of my memories. But we both knew each other six years ago. That shy part of her had always been there, but she did seem to develop the allure you'd expect of a girl her age. Especially in her breasts, yes. The kid we met earlier, Kanon is her little brother. He's not exactly my little brother. Still, he loves me like a big sister. He didn't cause you any trouble, did he? He's the same as always. If only he was just a little bit more sociable. I apologize if he's caused you any trouble. Nah, he didn't cause any trouble at all. As a fellow man, I understand how moody you can get at that age. It's no surprise he's unsociable. I get caught that all the time too. That's not, it's not good. I get caught unsociable. Just like Kanon. Why are you? It's not a brag. You aren't unsociable at all, Maria. Who the fuck you think you talking to? Ooh, ooh. I'm unsociable as fuck. Ooh, ooh. Mind your manners, bitch. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Wanted to be like him. <laughs> um, you said the meal was ready, right? Shit's probably gone cold now. Lock in. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Your meal has been fully prepared, so please allow me to guide you all to the mansion. Chanon bowed again formally and returned to her duty mode. We realized that if we made her stick around for any more light conversation, it would actually make it harder for her to do her job. I just told a bunch of niggas in the Discord that I'm beating my dick to Umi Neko gameplay. That's some real shit. We realized that if we made her stick around for any more light conversation, it would actually make it harder for her to do her job. We got off our asses to avoid interfering with the work any further. So, shall we go to the mansion? Everyone's probably hungry, right? Yeah? I'm really looking forward to Goda's food. That guy was apparently a, 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 a chef at a famous hotel. He's super good at cooking. We need Gordon Ramsay to come fuck this nigga up. Mm. Ooh, I can't wait. Let's go, Maria. We're gonna stuff ourselves like pigs. Maria! Maria! I'm sorry. Every time I see every every time I see her name, I think of Shadow of the Hedgehog. Stuff ourselves like pigs. No, no. You can't take everything Battler says seriously, okay? Because he's always just joking around. Let's go. Under Shannon's guidance, we headed towards the mansion. A mansion in Wisconsin. I've got too much fucking energy. This is what happens when I don't record for upward for a damn near a week. I'm I, like the next time I record, I'm just full of fucking energy. And I'm just saying bullshit and stupid shit and dumb shit and sometimes gay shit. And most of the time, freaky shit. Met once by the magnificent Rose Garden. We continued onward as the intimidating mansion of the Ashura Mia had family came into view. Now I say freaky shit when I'm sleep deprived. It had apparently been built shortly after the war, so you could feel the dignity of an almost half century hanging about it. The building was gorgeous on the surface, but old as it was. The equipment such as the AC and eating were apparently quite frail. Y'all niggas rich as fuck, but y'all don't got good AC? Lock the fuck in. What's your money for? According to Jessica, midwinter was especially tough, what with all the drafts. Haven't these people ever heard of a Kotatsu? Oh, hell no. I don't like that. This music is nice. I like that little design on his, on his um, suit. As we entered the entrance hall, an aged servant greeted us. Now him I remember, Genji, who had been working here longer than anyone, filled the role of head servant. 
We got the same hairline. Battler, it has been quite some time since we last met. As our eyes met, it greeted me with a calm, composed voice. His bow wasn't as grateful or refined as Goda's, but despite its simplicity, it communicated his feelings very well. Genji, it really has been a while. You look well. Thank you. I have been quite well. And Battler, you have become a splendid young man. You are beginning to resemble the master in his youth. I look like grandfather? Guess that means grandfather was pretty popular with the ladies when he was young. Hey! <laughs> Woo. From here on, I shall take Shannon's place in the company. Please, come this way. Come this way. Shannon bowed deeply and watched us leave. After that, we headed towards the dining room under Genji's guidance. Genji was like Kumasawa, so in stark contrast to us young people who had grown beyond recognition over the last six years. His appearance was exactly the same as in my memory from six years ago. It was as though time had stopped since the last time we met. Genji was an extremely quiet and diligent person. He was basically grandfather's closest aide or caregiver, and you might have been called on grandfather's companion of many years. In fact, it seems he was by grandfather's side even more often than my late grandmother was. They was fucking. According to Jessica, grandfather trusted him more than any of his blood relatives. But I wonder how long he served. I never got the details, but I heard something about him being here since the very beginning, when this mansion was first constructed, which would mean that he's dedicated half of his life to serving here. It's easy to see why he's so trusted. This violin is making me hard. As we passed through the mansion hall, the massive hall that extended up into the second story of the mansion with no separating flaw, I spotted something that hadn't existed in my memory of six years ago. Is that is that the painting of Beatrice? I know some I know I like like I know like important characters' names or like popular characters. I mean, like, I'm a Higarashi fan, so, like, I've be, I be seeing Umineko shit, too. Damn, this is moving slow as hell. Yeah, that's the painting of Beatrice. Why did I say it with an accent? Hi! Hi, Beatrice. Alright, stop fucking staring at me. Damn. It was an awfully big portrait hanging right in front of the stairs at, the, at that rose to the second floor. Without thinking, I stopped walking, captivated by it. Since I stopped so fast, Maria, who was following behind me, ran into my back. <laughs> what, nigga? Ooh, woo! Uh, sorry. Hey, Jessica. Has that picture always been there? I pointed at the big, prominently displayed portrait in the hall. Everyone else stopped, too. Oh, right. When you last came here, that hadn't been hung up yet, had it? When was it again? Well, if my memory doesn't fail me, it was put on display sometime around the year before last? You are correct, sir. In April of the year before last, the master put it on display here, having previously ordered a painter to create it. He is fiending for that. He is fiending for her. He wants her so bad. She don't like you, little. You don't. She don't like you, old nigga. Grandfather did that. So he paid to have it painted just for him, huh? The portrait suited suited this western mansion, and the woman in that elegant dress gave off a sense of refinement. I couldn't have guessed her age, but her sharp eyes and strong wills she seemed to possess made her look youthful. She seemed somehow different from the composed middle-aged women you often see in famous pictures. If she had normal black hair, I would have assumed it was a portrait of my long-deceased grandmother in her prime. However, she had beautiful blonde hair and didn't look, look Japanese at all. So, just who is this lady? Maria answered that question, simple question enthusiastically as though proud she knew the answer. I know! She's Beatrice! 
I don't like how that I don't like how that note hit when she said that. Bea, the fuck did you just say to me? Beatrice. 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 Oh, duh, hold on. I'm sorry. That that might be disrespectful to the accent. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. If that if that was rude, I didn't mean it. If that was rude, I wasn't trying to be rude. Beatrice. She's a witch. The fuck? So we're just gonna so we're just gonna drop that drop that bomb like it's nothing. Like that, that's just no. I just realized you can see his eyes through the glasses. I thought I thought the glasses were just white. So we're just gonna act like that's normal. Didn't you ever hear stories about her long ago? A witch? You mean the witch of this island? I think I already said this, but Rakanjima is a small island, only 10 kilometers in circumference. However, that's actually pretty massive, considering only the Oshiromiya family lives here. So only the harbor and the area around the mansion were set up to be lived in. Beyond that, the island remained as untouched as when it was uninhabited. The vast and empty forest had absolutely no lights, phones, or people passing through. To understand how dangerous that is, you need to forget your common sense as a city dweller. After all, if you happen to fall down a hole in the depths of the forest and sprain your ankle, no one would come save you, no matter how much you cried or screamed. Then once sun went down, the forest would be wrapped in complete darkness since there were no street lights. Since there were no signs, it'd be easy to get lost and confused, losing your sense of direction inside that dark forest. Nowadays, most people see a forest as a peaceful place, which are the people of bygone eras, before the light of civilization drove out the night, forests were as geographically separated from civilization as the sea. There were oceans above the ground. Fishermen who would go into the ocean are putting their lives at risk despite their technical knowledge. In the same way, hunters who go out in the forest are in danger despite having specialized knowledge of their own. That's hard as fuck. If children were to go play in such a dangerous forest, something terrible might happen. Someone's parents must have thought so. Maybe grandmother first said it, or maybe it was grandfather himself. Or perhaps the story's been passed down on this island since, since almost ancient times. There's a terrible witch in the forest, so you must not go in. At some point, the ghost story of Rakanjima was born. This is the legend of Rakanjima's witch. That's why when we talk about a witch on this island, we're referring to the master of that vast and savage forest. Come to think of it, when I say to this mansion as a little kid, during those eerie nights when the wind and rain pounded on the windows, I can remember being terrified by a story of the forest witch who roamed around searching for human sacrifices. So, Beatrice, huh? When Anaki mentioned it, I searched my memory and was, sh and was sure I recalled hearing a name like that when I was little. I see. Still, I totally forgot that the, that the witch in the legend had an elegant name like Beatrice. So the grandfather go out of his way to have this portion made just because the grandchildren didn't believe the story? She's the witch from grandfather's delusions. Ever since he had this picture hanged, he's been having a harder and harder time telling the difference between truth and fantasy. To us, she's just a witch that exists in grandfather's mind. But to him, she's a being that exists on this island. Exists. He says he says he has that painting made because the rest of us would be incapable of understanding otherwise. I'm gonna be real with you though. If he's able to tell how she looks this fucking perfect, she might exist. <laughs> Whole thing's creepy as hell. Milady. This portrait is precious to the master. I beg of you, do not say such things in front of him. I know. Even if you didn't tell me, I never do something like that. Jessica glanced at the portrait with an irritated gaze before turning away. Let's go. We're making everyone wait in the dining room. I'm hungry! 
Only a small portion of this island was controlled by the Shiramiya family. All of the lawless remainder was the domain of the witch Beatrice. You might even call her the true ruler of Rock and Jima. I felt a faint revival of that unsettling sense of misfortune, which I'd felt when I learned of the tutelary god shrine being struck by lightning. And I remembered that Kumasawa tried to tell an ominous story about Rock and Jima before Jessica stopped her. I don't know what she was planning to tell us about this island, but I do know one thing, though. Bitches, they, this isn't the Ushiramiya family. It isn't the Ushiramiya family that rules Rock and Jima. It's the witch, Beatrice. That's right. After all, this is the witch's island. And we in the witch's house. You're slow! When I looked around, everyone was already headed to the dining room. I hurriedly, I, I hurriedly, I hurriedly, I hurriedly chased after them. There we go. Come on, Zeke. Let's not be illiterate. You know how to read. I'm sure you do. You pass language arts. We walked up to the huge double doors that led to the dining room. Genji knocked. I have brought the children. Please, pardon the intrusion. The doors were open and we were invited inside. The dining room looked exactly like you imagine a rich person dining room to be. I had a super long table that was obviously positioned with no purpose other than to make the guests conscious of their rank. Our parents were already sitting in accordance with that ordering. You're late, brats. Hurry up and take a seat. The old bastard pressed us to sit. The only gaps in that group of people were the spots we were supposed to sit, which only made us feel our tardiness all the more. The seat at the end of the table caught the incipient's chair was for the most highly ranked, reserved for grandfather. It was still empty. He probably wanted to show up last for dramatic effect. From the perspective of someone facing the incipient's chair head on, the seating order went from left to right, from left to right with the lower ranking seat's position and rows of two further away from it. So the left hand side of the first row, closest to the incipient's chair, that's where Uncle Cross would have sat since he was the highest in rank. Looked like he hadn't arrived yet, so that seat was empty. Across from his chair on the right side of the first row sat the eldest daughter of the family on Ava, who was the third highest ranked. The left hand side of the second row was for the fourth highest in the rank. There sat my damn dad, Rudolph, the third of the siblings. Across from him on the right side of the second row sat Aunt Rosa, the youngest sibling. At this point, you might expect their husbands and wives to come next. But nope, left hand seat in his third row, rank number six belonged to Jessica. Opposite, opposite of her was George. I sat next to Jessica. Maria sat across from me. Then finally, next to me on the left hand side of the fifth row, sat Aunt Natsuhishi, the 10th highest in rank. Damn, they don't fuck with you. <laughs> you live here and they don't even fuck with you. Oh, I forgot. She's a wife. She's a wife, so she's low rank. I forgot. My fault. Opposite of her was Uncle Ihideyoshi. Next to, next to Aunt Natsuhi in the sixth row in the final seat was Kirie-san. The opposite... The seat opposite to Kirie was empty, even though silverware had been set there and everything. According to this ranking system, that's the spot where Aunt Rosa's husband should be sitting. Even though it wasn't supposed to be coming, his place was made up. Normally, ranking systems of this sort give spouses equal positions as their partners, but the Ushira Mia family system was unique. Maybe it's a remnant of male shot, whatever that means. If you st I know what it means, but I don't know how to say it. If you start with the assumption that a woman's womb is just something to be borrowed, then the children of direct descent would come first, directly followed by the grandchildren. In other words, spouses have no blood ties and are therefore placed at the end of the line. It's terrible, but by this system, my grandmother would have been ranked even lower than me if she were still alive. In their youth, they obeyed their father. It... There's an old saying, women have no home in my realm. Hold on, what did he say? I want to know what he said. 
Hold on, I want to know what he said. Hold on. In their youth, they obeyed their father. After getting, after they got, after they getting married, their husband, after aging their children. Oh, hold on. In their youth, they obey their father. After they get married, their husband. After aging, their children. There's an old saying: Women have no home in my in any realm. Long ago, I was still incapable of figuring all this out. I thought it was so great that we could all chat in our little groups. Adult siblings with adult siblings, cousins with cousins. However, now that I can re-examine the seating order after growing up a bit, it stirs up some very complicated feelings in me. Aunt Natsuhi, who was married to the eldest son and was a de facto number two in managing the family set to my right, which meant she was two steps lower than me in the ranking order. It was hard to imagine what might be going on inside her heart. That's why I made a small ap apolo apologetic gesture towards her before sitting down. How nice to see you, battler. You've grown quite tall, haven't you? Uh, yep. Yeah. Six long inch, six long years of eating well, sampling various cuisines, deriving sustenance from Mother Earth's bountiful gifts. Hard work, but I pulled through. Growing just like a boy, I see. How tall are you now? I guess about 180 centimeters. I don't know how tall that is. How much is 180 centimeters? Let me see. He's five foot nine. I'm taller than him. But I'm not. I guess about 180 centimeters. But I'm not so eat. That's what you're supposed to say. Heck, sounds like all you did was eat. Huh? Oh, oh. I'm sorry. After a short pause, she did laugh with me, but it seems she couldn't figure out what she was supposed to be laughing at. <laughs> she didn't get the joke. This woman is Aunt Natsuhi. She's the wife of the other side of the family, meaning she's my father's older, older brother's wife. Is it simple if I just call her Jessica's mother? I, I, it feels bad to say it like this, but while I didn't exactly dislike her, I didn't particularly like her either. She's hardly ever spoke with us kids, and all my memories of her involve her talking to the adults about complicated things with a scary look on her face. In fact, since we hardly ever exchanged words, I spent a long time trying to figure out how I should approach her. Though my efforts seemed to have ended in failure. The silverware sat neatly on the table, but the meal itself hadn't been brought in yet. As a general rule, you couldn't start a meal until the person sitting at the head of the table arrived. So as long as grandfather didn't come, lunch would be put on hold indefinitely. Not even the appetizers would arrive. Simply put, the silence in his room was caused by our parents enduring their hunger while they waited for grandfather to arrive. However, the grandfather of my memories would always show up on time to meals like this. He was the kind of person who would never be so late that it kept everyone waiting, especially after the entire group had arrived. Grandfather's pretty late. As far as I can remember, he was always strict about time. Well, that might have been true six years ago. But it hasn't been that way lately. In fact, he's off in his own little world so often, he doesn't even show up at family meals. Still, I figured he'd at least come down today. Then again, I feel a lot more relaxed and happy without him. Jessica! When her mother scolded her, Jessica stuck her tongue out and looked away. No way around it. Might as well wait until our host arrives. When I glanced at the clock, it was almost 10, 12, 20. My palm itches. There he is! Oshiro Mia Kenzo, the A's family head of the Oshiro Mia head family. That fit is hot. I want to cosplay him. That fit is hard. I mean, I, I kind of don't because I feel like that fit is very uncomfortable, but that fit is hard. This man could be seen in his study. The clock had already passed noon, but he didn't even attempt to rise from his seat. With his spectacles on, he built up a growing pile of books with elaborate bindings, which he then read intently. He couldn't really say he was having too much fun to stop. Rather, he filled the room with a sense of impatience, or perhaps a sense of impending danger, as though every second wasted was a tragedy. 
In this sealed room, a dense dust danced through the air, which was thick with the stench of chemicals and exuded a mix of suspicious odors. Those odors were somehow sweet and heavy. If anyone with a normal nose came in here, the first thing they'd do was the first thing they do would be to open a window and ventilate this room. The knocking against the study door had been going on for a while. A voice calling, Father, sometimes mingled with the knocks. As Kenzo heaved a deep sigh, he snapped shut the old book in his hands and slammed it on the table. Then he yelled at Krauss who was still knocking on the door. Silence, bitch nigga! Enough with that racket, you fool! Who told you the door would be open if you but not? I'll crucify the imbecile! Do you wish to suffer the same fate? Father, this is the day of the family conference, which happens only once a year, is it not? Everyone's gathered down below. Please, come out. Krause yelled, at his, yelled out to his father through the door. Kenzo always shut himself in the study, hating it when nearly anyone, even his own family, entered the room. For that reason, Krause had no choice but to call him from the corridor like this. MOLEST ME NOT! What? <laughs> I will not allow you to molest me! Just who is this everyone of which you speak? Do you mean the fools trying to drag me out of here? Then kill them all! Tear them apart! Use their bodies for firewood and feed them to the witch's hearth! Put a pot in the hearth to boil the warm wood! Force the imbeciles who dare to lure me out of here to drink the broth of the apocalypse! I will soak their dregs in liquor! Ah, where is Genji? Call for Genji! Have my demonic absence be prepared! The whispering of the green fairy reaches me no longer! Ah, uh, where is Genji? Bring him here! That gave me a headache. This man has gone insane. On the other side of the door, Kraus, Nanjo, and Genji kept waiting for the master of the house, who stubbornly refused to come out. Ugh, he's ugly! Looks like he hates me to the core. My voice doesn't reach him anymore. Kraus shrugged as though saying it's no use and smiled bitterly. From the beginning, he hadn't really expected his father to respond to his cause. However, since it was the duty of the eldest son, he had tried as a formality. Kinzo-san! Your sons, daughters, and grandchildren have come to see you, have they not? Could you just let them see your face, if only for a short while? Shut up! Be silent! You dare to admonish me, Nanjo? I never told anyone to get you. I told them to get Genji. Now call for him immediately. Now! Time is short, and the apostles are already readying their trumpets. So why can't you foolish sheep understand? Kenzo slammed his old heavy book against the table over and over. That racket clearly expresses great displeasure. Kenzo put his spectacles down and flew up from his chair. He spread his arms wide open as if to sing a, as if to sing to a packed opera house, as if appealing to someone and yelled. Why? Why is there always something in my way? I would throw it all away. I would offer up everything. And there is only one thing I ask in repayment. Oh, Beatrice! If only I could see your smile but one more time! I would plunder the smiles of the earth and offer them all up to you! Ooh, commanders of the legions and locusts! Reap the smiles of earth! Everything is filthy! Everything is irksome! Why must I suffer this impediment? This impediment of the most precious of my days! 
call for Genji! I have no idea what he's yelling about. He's probably lost his mind by now. Kraus, isn't it a bit harsh to say such a thing of your own father? My father's already dead. There's nothing more but a he's there is nothing more there's nothing fuck. There's nothing here but a phantom of what my father once was. At any rate, as long as he has no intention of coming out, there's nothing we can do. Kinzo. Choking coughs continue to pour from the study. I'm going back downstairs. It would be a waste to let the fruits of Goda's prize cooking talent get any colder. It's one of the few things our relatives can look forward to when they come to this house. Kraus spun around. He looked at his watch, mumbling and acting as though he had wasted time doing something he knew would be in vain. Genji, father is calling for you. Keep him company. Certainly. Certainly. Dr. Nanjo, let's go eat. If we stay here any longer, this sweet stench will ruin our sense of taste. Without waiting for Nanjo, Kraus went downstairs. Genji urged Nanjo to go eat. Nanjo glanced between the study door and Kraus's back as the latter disappeared down the stairs, then let out a deep sigh. Sorry, Genji. But please, allow me to leave this in your hands. Yes. Please, leave it to me. Do what you can to avoid giving him alcohol. That's a habit far too difficult to break. Is Genji not here yet? Who dares keep Genji from coming? Where's Genji? Call for Genji! Damn, nigga, get the dick out your mouth. That's why you coughing so much? Please. Allow me to handle the situation here. Very well. Forgive me. Nanjo bowed slightly and descended the stairs. Genji watched him leave and knocked on the study door. Master, it is Genji. Genji! Why have you kept me waiting so long? You're alone, I trust? Correct. I am alone. Kenzo returned to his seat in the study and pressed an old-fashioned switch on the table. After a small delay, a heavy sound of the door unlocking could be heard. Kenzo was convinced that his family wanted to make a mess of his study. Or perhaps someone had once opened the window for some air and ended up scattering things that, to him, were important research materials, leaving him in a terrible mood. Kenzo had outfitted his room with a formidable lock, preventing anyone from entering without his permission and thereby sealing himself in a jail of his own making. Genji, whom he trusted the most, was relatively free to enter the room, but even that didn't always hold. If Kenzo was in a bad mood, even Genji wouldn't be able to enter. Anyone else would be limited to holding a conversation to the door, unable to see Kenzo's face. And most of the time, what they got could hardly be called a conversation. However, this didn't trouble the rest of the family much. After all, it just wasn't worth the effort to disturb this aging family head, who was impossible to please and always stayed shut away immersed in his research. Taking advantage of his refusal to leave the room, they supported his isolation, putting his care entirely in the hands of the servants. Genji, my usual. I'm busy. Yes, sir. Genji headed to the corner of the study. There, suspicious looking bottles. <laughs> venomous cup boasting venomous covered colors were on display. They were actually liquor. But considering the shady atmosphere of this room, one might easily suspect them as being some ghastly poison. Inside the study, the mysterious collection of books gathered by Kenzo had grown into a mountain. They were bizarre ancient band they were bizarre ancient or banned books. All of them either forbidden, cursed, or sealed. But if you tried calling them old books, 
Kenzo would fly into a rage and say, Call them Grimoires! There were also many mysterious objects that presumably held some meaning in regards to black magic, like candles suspiciously melted and molded into strange shapes. The constellations drawn on certain celestial globe con on a certain celestial globe contained quite a few shapes that would draw puzzled looks from anyone familiar with today's night sky. The carelessly strewn about books contained many, in many illustrations, all of them of a religious or mysterious nature including some depicting demonically grotesque subjects or bizarre diagrams of various magic circles. And above all, a sweet poisonous smell filled the room, profoundly assaulting the eyes and noses of those who entered for the first time. Eventually it must surely make a person go numb and lose their grip on reality. Inside that study, Genji prepared Kenzo's usual drink with a well-trained hand. No one would even think of drinking such an ominous dark green liquid in that complex and ornate glass unless someone first told them it was alcohol. He poured a little into the glass. Then he placed a cube of sugar in a strangely shaped spoon and poured water from a pitcher over it. Strangely, when the transparent water was poured, the dark green color turned cloudy white. It was a strange optical illusion. And so the water had caused a chemical reaction and made the drink become even more unrecognizable as liquor. Then Genji added original flavors Kenzo loved, fine-tuning its taste. There was no recipe. Its success was measured only by Kenzo's mood swings when he drank it, and it had taken Genji many decades to learn how to do it right. Genji placed a glass on a tray and walked over to Kenzo. By this time, Kenzo was ga gazing out of the window. Here, Master. Thank you. Kenzo had regained his composure and was now unrecognizable as a shouting, screaming, yelling man from a few moments ago. Looking at this man from behind as he tilted his glass and gazed down at the scenery beyond the window, he projected his sense of dignity and intelligence. To allow Kenzo to set his glass down at any time, Genji motionlessly, motionlessly waited behind Kenzo to his left as though he were a living sideboard. Then, without averting his eyes from the window, Kenzo held out his glass. There was only a mouthful remaining. It was not a gesture intended to set it upon the tray, but a motion to hand the glass over to Genji. Drink. My friend. Your words are too kind for me. No need for ceremony between us. Drink, my friend. Thank you. Genji respectfully received the glass and inclined it a little to taste its contents. After that, it gulped it down. I attempted to imitate your concoction, but no matter how I try, I cannot replicate the taste. The way you make it is pure relish. Thank you very much. It is the fruit of your guidance, Master. <laughs> Kenzo smiled at his, lovely, at his loyal servant, subject, who refused to put aside rank even when asked to. However, he was not making fun of him. His smile was relaxed, as though chuckling at a close friend's old, unshakable habit. <laughs> we have grown old together. I stopped counting the years long ago. It is entirely thanks to you, Master, that I have been able to live like this until today. Kenzo gave a faint smile as if to say he didn't need any flattery. Until now, you have served me exceedingly well. My sons called me eccentric. The servants that were once many have all quit in fear of me. Only you serve me even now. Your words are more than I deserve. My life will not last much longer. My sons are vultures, lazily waiting for my inheritance to fall into their hands. Kraus is a fool who squanders mo money like water, who throws away two gold coins to obtain one. 
And then he has the god to claim that he's earned money. Ava is a slave to money, who thinks of me as a mere chicken. When I die, she plans to use my bones to make a broth. That Dutch Rudolph just wants to fool around with women. Rosa, for the baby of a man who come from nowhere and about whom we know nothing. Jessica is incompetent and uneducated. George has none of what it takes to be a man. Battler is a fool who threw away the honor of the Ushiramiya family. And Maria is obscene to the eye. Why is the Ushiramiya blood so incompetent? Is there no one worthy to inherit the glory I built? Oh, of course I know. This is part of Beatrice's curse, I know it. You golden witch. Are you trying to take revenge against me in this way? If you want to hate me, then do so. If you want to run away, then run. I won't let you go. 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 You belong to me. You must always be in my arms for all my life. You must stay in my birdcage for all eternity, whispering only to me. Beatrice, why would you smile back at me? Oh, Beatrice. Oh, I'm lightheaded. After howling, Kenzo choked once again. Genji set the tray and glass down and rubbed his master's back. Genji's facial expression did not change. It was always like this. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. When he, seem when he seemingly deranged, fit subsided. Kenzo regained his composure once again. It was like seeing two different people. A wild Kenzo and a, and a composed Kenzo living together inside one body. And so, I have decided. I cannot bear to spend my dead remaining years procrastinating like this. If I have one final coin to bet, then I choose to abandon it to the whims of the demon's roulette. The power of magic is always determined by the risk of the gamble. Like visiting a shrine at the hour of the ox in ancient Japanese sorcery to nail a cursed doll to a tree. Magical power is produced specifically to, specifically because of the risk that it will be seen within, min, the, within the seven days the curse takes. The greater the risk, the stronger the magic power will be. Many miracles that happen in myth might be called the crystallization of shocking magic power with the low probability of occurrence and astronomical risk. That Moses parted waters of the sea was not a miracle of God. The risk of that situa of that desperate situation, cornered by soldiers on the Red Sea shores, weighed upon the scales of slaughter and gave birth to a miraculous magic power. If the same thing occurred on the same scale, the sea would surely fail to part. After all, Moses was able to magnificently summon a miracle engraved on but one of the countless innumerable results on the roulette of, that, of those with power. That is the force that can triumph over astronomical odds. Indeed, good fortune can only be, can only, good fortune that can grasp miracles is magical power itself. Rika? Huh? To obtain this mighty power, one may face the risk of despair. Rika and Hanyu? What? Those who possess no magic power may call that desperation rather than a bet. However, people who truly do possess magic power can grasp hold of that miracle and make the enigma come into being. And if that power exists within me, I'll seize that miracle. I don't have a chance of making the wish I devoted my life towards come true. Kenzo looked to the, up to the sky outside the window. He spread his arms as if appealing to someone in the skies. If only! If only I were capable of grasping that miracle! Ah! Beatrice! Beatrice! Show me your lovely smile once more! 
No matter how much time passes, your face does not vanish. I just want to see your smile, that is all. I'll return everything you granted me. I'll return all the glory I've gained since that day. I do not need fortune, prestige, or gold. I'll return everything you gave me. I just want to see your smile. I beg you, Beatrice. His nonsensical yells became a scream and then a wail. Kenzo slumped to the floor, tearing at it with both hands. Genji had no choice but to wordlessly watch over his master's lamentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the family's sad health is not at its best. He seemed extremely sad not to be able to share lunch with you all, now that you have gathered for this event that occurs but once a year. Goda, let the lunch begin. Certainly. I shall begin today's lunch yarn. Dr. Nanjo, is father's condition really that bad? Couldn't he, have let us, couldn't he have at least let us see his face? It's more a problem of mood than a physical condition. And for that, there's no medicine I can prescribe. Hey, are we talking about his mood again? You've got to be kidding me. We took time out of our schedules during this damn busy autumn season just to come and find out how he's doing. And now he's... Then you should be happy, Rudolph. You know now how he's doing. Or would you rather take my place and try to persuade our ill-humored father to come join us? Are you kidding me? Rudolph shrugged. Apparently, though Rudolph was willing to be indignant to show how self-centered his father was, he wasn't particularly disappointed to be spared a face-to-face -face meeting. Does it seem like his mood will improve before dinner? I have no idea. If you want to know that, you should ask him directly. Although, I think his mood will improve faster if we don't bother him. Genji is the only person who can get grandfather out of a funk. It's pretty pathetic though. Making the servants deal with your own parents' bad mood? Jessica. Don't speak out of turn. He basically just said, shut the fuck up. <laughs> She'd planned for a complaint to be heard only by her cousins, but at her reach even crossed his ears. Scolded, Jessica scowled and turned away sulking. If he's as cranky as they make him sound, he can't be that terribly sick, right? I mean, they're saying he's in a bad mood, not that he's got no energy, which at least proves he's got his wits about him. It's because grandfather especially has strong will. However, that doesn't necessarily mean his body will be able to keep up. Since last year, they keep saying he has three months left. The initial diagnosis was correct. Grandfather has been prolonging his life by willpower alone. It's only right for us to worry about him. Lunch started with the family head seats still empty. The man who should be sitting there had grown old. And the brilliant glory which had, re which had rebuilt the Ushira Mia family in a span of a single lifetime was being forgotten. Even though they were even though they were beginning the meal with that with that seat still empty, no one felt that it was odd anymore. That scared the fucking shit out of me. That scared the fucking shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that scared the shit out of me. Alright, that's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment, I read a must have been to the next one. I'm really liking this game, bro. But like this is so freaking interesting. I, I bro, I know this is gonna be a long ass series, so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to keep giving y'all my thoughts and feelings at the end of every episode, especially when there's not really shit going on. But Kenzo. I mean, we already knew bro was going crazy. Bro was tweaking out over Beatrice. Like, the pussy must have been fucking fantastic. Like, she must have had fucking... Dog, she must have had the grip. Shut up.
Alright, that's the end of the episode, guys. If you guys enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and read a must. I'll be to the next one. Peace out.